Um, so anyhow, so thank you, thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to come here after I was here on Blab 2. This is my next one after that. Um, and I have today, uh, I was kind of happy that they chose this topic. It's on the ethics of using social media data for health research. I gave them two topics to choose from. They chose this one. Uh, it's particularly uh, dear to my heart because that's the number one question I get. Every single time I present on our social media work, this is where the questions come from. So I hope that we can have uh, some time for discussion um, towards the end of my, of my allotted time. Otherwise, I'm going to be here today and tomorrow, full day and half day, and I'm always uh, open to discussing and, and, and answering questions out of the experience that we've had. Um, this is, uh, my work in social media has been funded for eight years. I was just talking to someone uh, to, along the way about it. Um, as far as I know, it is the first R01 uh, granted by the National Institutes of Health on social media research. Um, so I've been working at this, and, and prior to that, it was three more years. When we started this research, it was three years ahead of when I finally got funding for it. So it, it took a long time. Um, tweet. Um, Twitter, to me, is a really good communication media. Um, so not only do I do research in social media, I do believe it, it, it has its role in research and academic life. Um, so I put my Twitter handle. Obviously, email also works. So. So let's um, start by thinking, who uses social media? And these days, actually, the question should be, who doesn't use social media? Um, your social media has become ever-present in all circles, in all ages. This graph, sh graph shows over the years the percentage of United States adults who use at least one social media by age bracket. The top line is the youngest 18 to 29-year-olds. But if you look at the bottom line, those are 65 years and older. That, uh, when at the beginning it was very common for them not to use it, you see it has spiked up. So now we get about 30% of the, of the um, adults 65 years and older use social media, and that's going to tend to grow as we age. So, um, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to just keep growing. Uh, and the youngest bracket, 18 to 29 year olds, were all the way up to 80 percent, 85 percent, and I will contend that it's even more. This is based on Pew Research data. So overall, 79 percent of the U.S. population as a whole uses social media, one or another of the social media outlets. Uh, worldwide, it's estimated at 45 percent. This is data from Statista. The other one is from Pew, Re uh, Pew Research. Um, Again, it depends uh, which one. Um, I've always get also the questions about Twitter versus Facebook versus Instagram versus others. Um, it's going to vary. It varies in Europe versus Asia versus Africa, uh, Latin America, and so on. Regardless, uh, in most countries, I think except China, we can find easily accessible social media data that we can use on Twitter. Um, I think the next question will be around how long do people spend on social media. Right now, the estimate is about three hours a day, which is incredibly high. Three hours of a day of everybody, probably in this room, is spent on reading social media posts, posting, writing, replying, looking at it. And yeah, you, everybody's going to say, no, I just took half an hour. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, so this. The significance of this is the amount and variety of data we can get from social media is just tremendous. It's not to be ignored. It has its pros, its pros and cons. So Twitter data for health research. Um, uh, on the upside, large volume of user-generated text. Um, tweets are publicly available to view and use. Actually, we'll get more into it. That's exactly the topic of the talk today. Um, uh, the, the, they have specific characteristics depending on whether you go with Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook style, or Reddit, they have different characteristics. Um, part of my background is in communications, pure communications, like newspaper style communications. I have a minor in journalism. Um, and one of the things we learn is that the media is important. You cannot just take all of them flat and use them because their purpose and model is different. The model of communication in each of these platforms is different. So I might 
or might not get into that a little more. But basically for Twitter, I prefer it myself because of its um, uh, specific characteristics as a communication medium. So it is more like a journal where people tweet about their lives on a, and, and you can like distinguish the temporal nature of it versus for example, um, tw uh, let's go to the extremes like Reddit where you post about your interests and it's, there's no necessarily a, a timeline associated with it. Even if you were to take all the posts that somebody made on Reddit, it's not the same as a Twitter timeline. Okay, so the timeline temporal longitudinal nature is very, very important for health research. Um, Twitter provides an application programming interface, API, which is very straightforward in following the rules. It is really easy to use. It is made for this kind of stuff. Facebook doesn't, and again, each of these things will give us like enough material to talk for um, hours, I guess. So Facebook is different in that respect. Instagram is different in that respect. The API is not very easy. It's not really easy to collect data. Even Reddit doesn't make it easy. Um, so Twitter, for to me, is the entry point, and is the easiest one, the most transparent, the most uh, the most. Uh, um, uh, ethic, for ethical research, actually, is the easiest one to, to grab onto for different reasons, particularly because of the clarity of purpose that is well, very well communicated to people, uh, users of the platform. Still has many uh, uh, downsides using social media for health research. It's unstructured free text, which to me is an upside. Every time everybody tells me, it's like, well, it's all structured, like, uh, uh, boring data. Unstructured data to me is much more fun. Uh, so it's not exactly a but anyway, it represents downside in terms of the methods you use and so on, but all are challenges that are addressable. Um, it is contended to be mostly noise, uh, so one of the uh, challenges as researchers is to how to get to the actual signal and not uh, just noise. Um, informal language and misspellings, and uh, I mean, in my view, that's again something to just deal with and it actually has meaning. Um, and um, you need to get your end-to-end -end processing pipelines in place to properly use the data in research and systematically use the data in research. Um, one of the other uh, downsides, I guess, is that people fail to see this and that they take the tasks in isolation and then um, decide to publish on one of the tasks in the pipeline, say, and take the data, massage it, balance it and all kinds of things with it and then do a task and then publish a paper and there's many pub papers published like that don't get me wrong they are just not right in a way um and actually not right period uh because they are it's, <laughs> it's useless to publish say on just just to give a concrete example adverse drug reactions some of you might be familiar with with that a paper that was published on adverse drug reactions using the data we published um, and it was done in in what I consider improper way where they rebalanced the data got rid of all the negative examples got 95 percent positive examples only and then proceeded to train a model on that for adverse drug reaction extraction the model then was published saying this is state-of-the-art performance and so we publish a whole editorial that is, I think, the longest one that was allowed at Jamia because we exceeded it by twice. Instead of 1,500 words, we were allowed 3,000 words. It's almost a paper, actually. Uh, but it had to be done as a comment to that paper because there were already six or seven papers citing that paper using the data in the same incorrect way. So anyway, so read that. It's an interesting read. So end-to-end -end processing pipelines are not easy to construct so, and usually are underestimated. The amount of work that it takes to do one of those pipelines is usually underestimated in grants. And therefore, people don't get the funding uh, for this thing. So this R01 has been continuously funded for eight years now. This shows the last three years of work past the renewal uh, point. Um, this is a longitudinal study from social media. Um, I'm showing the whole pipeline. We have work pretty much in every, one, every single one of these steps, getting the data from the Twitter API, how to get the right keywords to get it, for example. It's a paper on its own. And, and I have like two different ways of getting these keywords. Um, 
uh, we have generating spellings, which was kind of a funny thing to do back in the time, because usually you get spell correction. You don't get the other way around. There was no system that will generate misspellings for us. So we did one misspelling uh, approach to get how people will tweet about medications, for example. Medications are as hard to write, and so they will tweet them with different uh, with misspellings. And in order to collect the data, you need to get these ones up front. So we did that using phonemes. So people will think of sounds when they hear Xanax. They will either spell it with X or with a Z or with some many other ways. And many of the misspellings actually were more popular than the original spell. So, uh, so we got that moving along. In this case, for all renewal, we were focusing on pregnancy. So uh, getting who's pregnant from social media, uh, initial approach is basically on pregnancy announcements. So we were trying to capture pregnancy announcements uh, of many different kinds. We discovered that about 18 of these expressions gave us a lot of, uh, of content. Uh, we've grown that a little bit more in pregnancy announcements. I mean, when I say we're having a baby, um, I'm 14 weeks along in my pregnancy and so on, and we're going to be four, family of four. So there's many ways in which pregnancies are announced. Um, we've added more um, pregnancy announcements through a negative outcome, for example, address a few of the holes we had at the beginning. Miscarriage, for example, many women miscarried before they got a chance to announce because there's this cultural norm, at least in the U.S., to not announce your pregnancy until you're like 12 weeks along. So what happens is many lost the baby before they got a chance to announce the pregnancy. And we were missing that or that or, or data set was biased and we were not capturing that. And now we have corrected that. So along the way, just finding the right cohort thing is tricky. Um, birth defects, so after that we focus on, um, uh, on studying birth defects. Um, again, the whole development of the birth defects approach, how do you, we get the cases for that uh, took about six to nine months of work, just getting the right regular expressions, the right expressions, the right vocabulary, uh, variants of it, how is it, how are birth defects expressed in social media, and so on. So each of these steps, I said, is, it, it takes time. So we got that, we got that published. Um, I have a few of the citations in the slide at the bottom. Uh, the very first paper on, on, on uh, pregnancy um, cohort was in the JMIR journal. Um, main author was Abid Sarker. And then we had follow-ups on that. Uh, we have birth defects. The main author on that one is Ari Klein from my lab as well. And then um, the latest on that is on nature digital medicine. So we've gone, all right, we've moved along the, the spectrum of, of journals. This is serious research. It's starting to be taken seriously. Therefore, the ethics become either more important as you move along. Um, finding control groups. So here's just examples of these pregnancies. So we have a timeline. Um, so this date at the beginning, it says, I woke up today with a sore throat and stiff neck and feel even worse now. Advil bed, I hate viruses. That's the, the first tweet that you see here. The date um, is prior to the announcement. Okay, so the announcement of pregnancy is in July. This is, this is um, uh, in the same year. This is February 11. This is uh, July 11. It's time to announce that I'm having a baby and it's going to be a boy. And then November, well, today's my due date. So with the due date, we calculated back to the beginning of pregnancy and can get the pregnancy period. So that first tweet can indicate that that this woman took Advil ahead of even knowing that she was pregnant. Um, so uh, finally they got the birth of their son and then this is what we got for the birth defect. It's called Hirschsprung's disease. Um, so full spectrum, full story of, of this particular pregnancy. To capture that takes up quite a few of these steps. Um, we have medication mentions. We have how to get a control group. Uh, and then the mention is not enough. We need to know if they took or they're likely to have taken the medication. So medication intake is another one of those 
papers were published on classification and looking at that and so on. Medication mentioned is a recent paper by Davy uh, Weisenbach, who is here today. Uh, and um, it's a paper on that, on how to get the actual mentions of medications from the pipeline. Um, and finally, to a case control study. We published in drug safety a case control study, nested case control study, based entirely on social media. And um, one of the things that was key, and, and that paper that we published in Drug Safety had a very loose definition of a, of a, of a control, where, was, where there was no evidence that a birth defect had occurred, we took it to be a normal pregnancy. Yes, it is very, very broad, right? Um, so I criticized it myself went ahead and designed something better. Uh, at the time, we annotated around uh, 400 timelines. It takes about an average of two to three hours to annotate each user timeline. A lot of work. So 400 timelines times three hours, that's about 1,200 hours of annotation just to get that very first uh, drug safety paper. So yes, when people tell me, like, why didn't you do four controls per case, it's like a lot more time will be needed which through the years we've started to dedicate more time to it. This is an automatic approach. It is going to be presented at the AMI Joint Summits um, in March. Um, so you got a preview of it. This is, this is work that will be then shown there. Basically, we're doing better controls. It's one of the aims of my grant was actually how to get controls. It's harder than cases, believe it or not. Um, so normal controls are hard to get. We get dual expressions we get in this case if is the length of the pregnancy is came to term and the weight of the baby and we needed expressions for both in order to qualify for the same pregnancy that's the other trick we have multiple pregnancies sometimes in, the, in a single time um, so we changed we checked for all that and finally got our users to be a, a negative or a positive for a, a comparison group so um, even though each of the expressions a could be positive for, say, for example, I'm 38 weeks pregnant, I've never been this pregnant, it, it is positive for being term birth, but uh, for that same user, if we have, uh, uh, it is a different pregnancy actually, a whole year of difference in the dates of the tweets. So even that both uh, of our traps of regular expressions got, got a hit, one of the hits was for another pregnancy. And so it takes some doing. So where does that give you? So I gave you an example. As I said, it's three years of research summarized in about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. Um, the ethical question, ethical quandary. Uh, we're going to have all this inclination to say, well, the data is publicly available. You can reach uh, underserved um, uh, populations and bring their voice to the table. Um, social media makes research feasible and low cost, so it must be a good thing. Um, it's unfiltered data, so you can get what patients really think. And it's a simple question, okay? You can dismiss it all up front and say, oh, yeah, it's a simple question. So, of course, it's ethical. So, it has all these good things going for it. But beware, okay? Even though this might be true, ignoring the other side of the coin could be, could be dangerous. So that's why we get a little nod to Japan right there. <laughs> but, uh, uh, just because you guys are the first audience on, on, on this particular talk. Um, you have to consider the counterpoint, OK? The data can be traced back to specific people. Using the data willy-nilly could possibly result in harm to this individual, depending on what topic you're dealing with. Um, once we do research, we're taking it out of context. People might have said something, but they didn't mean for it to be used in a public forum. Okay? Um, so, things about mental health, things about illegal substance use, about um, um, risky, beha risky sexual behavior. All of those things are delicate topics. We, ca we cannot just take a tweet, put it up on a slide, and show it in a room. Because you really never know who's going to see that slide. Um, so it could result in harm. 
question it. Question yourself. Is it really publicly available? I've seen papers published where up front they say, we created 10 fake accounts, joined the private group, and collected the data. It's like it is published. You can find this paper. I'm like, okay, I'm, I, I don't, on purpose, I don't put that up, but you can look it up. Um, okay, just the word there, fake users. We created fake users and put them there. That's already deceiving. Okay, so some of your warning lights should come up with this and sirens sound in your office when you're doing these things. Okay. Um, it is difficult to determine what risk and privacy expectations are unique to social media. It's not a simple question. So you have to stop and think when you design these studies and try to de determine what you're doing. Um, black and white can quickly turn into gray. It's complicated. It's not easy. And you have to think about these things when you're doing research on this. So first question, is it human subjects research? And from all the questions, probably this is the easiest one to, to answer in a way. So who is a human subject? Uh, it's a, there's a, a definition for that. I'm using United States federal definitions for this. It varies by country, but in general is widely accepted um, uh, worldwide. So a human subject for purposes of health research and research uh, is a living individual about whom an investigator obtains data through interaction with the individual or through identifiable private information. The or gets us, okay? Even though we're not directly contacting them, we might still fall, fall under this. So let's think about this identifiable private business. So data is public if in information can be identifiable, but it's not private. Um, information, so data could still be public. Uh, information can still be identifiable, but it will be, if you, if you get into not private and you have the definition of not private down, uh, you will be fine, and I will get more into it. And information gathering requires no interaction with the person who posted it. So what does this mean in practice? Uh, I mean, who determines this first? And then we'll go into what it means in practice. Um, you will have to submit all of this to your institutional review board. Different names, different countries, but it's basically whoever oversees research in your company or your uh, academic institution. You need to submit your research to them. The research activities involving human subjects and limited to one or more of the exempt categories receive what is called an exempt determination. All my research is covered by this. So I have an exempt determination certificate from my IRB Institutional Review Board. Um, so anything that you see published is covered. So that was like every time I get the question, I say, yes, it is. It is, it was uh, exempt. It has an exempt determination. Um, it is usually the one that's applicable for social media data is called the 45 CFR 46.1 per four. So if you know this, you probably, uh, if you've heard this and you know this, that's usually what you use um, as an exempt um, category. It's uh, an exemption that covers existing data, document records, and specimens. It applies to that. If you use existing data, um, then you're fine. Um, so, so we'll see a little bit more of how this applies in practice. Okay, so bear with me for a second. One question that is usually not asked. Um, ethics and morals are often confused. So um, these things that we do with social media are covered under ethics. Okay, you might have some other uh, moral quandaries on this, but that are usually uh, those are usually more private, more personal than uh, ethics. So ethics are agreed upon principles of right conduct. They vary by discipline. There's like usually professional associations that publish these ethical guidelines for researchers. Um, they apply to institutions that conduct research, whether in academia or industry, so both have it. They are less subjective and less personal than moral behavior, okay? Personally, I will add moral behavior to my ethical behavior, but ethical behavior is a little bit less arguable in, in its inclinations than what we call moral behavior. Um, some groups that have established relevant principles include the American Public Health Association. Uh, obviously, this has the US bias. Um, 
I have to look up the, the World Health Organization has some guidelines and there will be some guidelines in each of, the, of your countries as well. Uh, the American Medical Informatics Association has another one. The Association of Internet Researchers is a little bit less American, but still, I mean, um, it applies. They have all published these ethical principles. Um, in general, ethical principles in, in health focus around the policy of do no harm. Okay? Your subjects are protected by that overarching question that if you are harming them, research is not an excuse to harm anyone. So in practice, what does this all mean? Well, use only data available to all users of a platform. It used to be that some institutions will say, if you have to use a user ID and password, then it's off limits. But, I mean, for example, to get Twitter data, you need a developer's ID and password. So that's an ID and password. That will mean all of Twitter will be out of the question. So many of these little rules are outdated already, but uh, but in general, use use only data available to all users of the platform. Okay, that's an easier um, definition to abide by. Um, private groups are off limits. Okay, there's a whole paper uh, made out there by Sue Walder. I have it in the references that um, they actually went and. Uh, found out what people think about this, how they feel about it, and so on. One of the things that um, that is important is private groups. Private groups are considered by people private, meaning if you have to join a group that shares something. I have several private groups that I've joined, and I've seen information there that I wish I could use in my research, but I couldn't use it without first telling the group that if they are okay for me to use that information. And in that case, I'm contacting them. And therefore, it's no longer an observational study. It's going to be considered some uh, like a clinical trial. It will fall under those rules. So in essence, I cannot use it. So getting these fake accounts, joining private groups, <laughs> definitely not within the bounds of ethical research. Um, and then there's the expectations of the people there. And you will often see, I don't know, I bet most of you have some of these private groups or have seen them or have used them. Most of the people that will say things that, that you will say, well, they, they like complain about family members not understanding their, 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 their particular situation. So it could really get them socially affected if the information were to get out. No, I don't do that myself, but some people do, right? It's like say things there that you think are not going to get out is dangerous because they sometimes will get out. Screenshots, screenshots of deleted tweets. Again, it's not ethical to use them, okay? Deleted tweets in the like are gone. And that's a whole other problem in practice for some of the things that I'm talking about here. Um, so we'll deal with that in a second about reproducibility. Uh, so private groups are off limits. Having an exempt determination doesn't mean you're exempt of all laws, okay? You are not exempt from local laws. There could be some local laws that apply to it, so be aware of that, state laws in the U.S. or any other regional, um, uh, uh, that every other regional institution or, or a government agency that has um, in, in influence or can legally go after you in a way. Institutional policies will usually cover you or ethical research. So that's why it is very, very important to submit to your IRB. That's sort of your layer of protection. Okay, so you submit what you're doing to your IRB. They know better if there's lo local laws or so on that apply. So you should be always wary of this. Um, my very, very first study, must confess, got me in trouble with my IRB because I did not submit it to IRB. Very, very first one, it was a class project. This is how all this got started. It was a class project. The student wanted to do research. He wanted to do what people talk about, uh, about their disease. And I thought that was very broad. And I suggested the thing about adverse drug reactions to him. It was like, let's focus on a specific things rather than like all these broad topics. Anyway, so that was the start of it. He did his research. Um, it was pretty cool, and we decided to submit it, and it was actually published as a workshop paper at BioNLP. 
in Switzerland, actually. Um, 2007 must have been. Um, that was the very first paper in, in happened to be, and this is traceable, there's no other paper before that one on other drug reactions from social media. Of course, I didn't know that at the time, I just published the paper, so it's one of those. Um, and so we published, and by virtue of publishing, it's a whole issue with IRB. I got funding. The IRB obviously was submitted because of that, and they found out about the paper, and they got at me, and I didn't know better. And so this is one of those lessons learned. What happened was we could not use that data. The IRB said, since that data was collected without IRB approval, you can no longer use it. So all the data for that paper has been banned uh, from uh, further use, and we never used it again. And so that paper is historical for those two reasons. Um, so I will say, most of all, none of your studies will ever accept you from common sense, OK? So I know common sense is a precious commodity. Um, you just have to be constantly questioning yourself about what you're doing and how you're doing it. What are good common sense measures? Just to give you some guidelines on this, not leave you all alone on the common sense issue. Ask yourself, cool revealing the information out of context result in harm either now or later? We have a case exactly like this. We were studying the birth defects, and we found a tweet in one of these timelines about um, illegal substance use. Oh, actually, it was not illegal, but anyway, it's just smoking during pregnancy, which is a general no-no. So what she said was, I'm tired of this. I'm out here in my truck uh, chain smoking. And so um, we saw the tweet. I, it was in a paper original, in the original draft of the paper. Before we submitted it, I was looking through it. I was like, I, this tweet seems too specific. We search for it, and lo and behold, I get a single person in the whole wide world that has that tweet. So, um, so at that point, I said, no, this is not something I want to do. Because women that have a baby with birth defects, um, and I count myself as one of them, uh, face a lot of lashback for, or, or from family. There's always these innocent questions about, well, what did you do during pregnancy? Like, I didn't do anything, OK? Uh, it's very, very, very hard to face those uh, questions from family members, even from their husbands, not mine. I was OK with it. But, but from family, definitely I got this. It's, it's sometimes um, it's just out of ignorance about the condition. It's out of many reasons. Anyway, we don't want any more spotlight on these women about things they might have done. And it might be, who knows? We don't know. The etiology of birth defects is very, uh, 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 it's missing, it's, it's unknown. The, the reason for this birth defects is unknown in many cases. Um, so, um, so either now or later, meaning don't just don't do it. Limit the specific social media posts used as examples in a scientific paper for the same reason, okay? So you can use some examples, but limit the use as much as possible. And if it's a delicate topic, mental health, illicit substance use, even substance use of any kind, sexually risky behavior, um, do not publish a post verbatim. Try it. Go to Twitter, see if you can find it again. Things like that. Modify the language enough so that it's not, you can literally not find it once you use And it's incredible how short uh, those of us in NLP know that four words can get you a very narrow one result very, very quickly. Okay, so it's, it's, it's incredible how unique language is in that sense. Platforms like Reddit that are built around anonymity kind of have the protection already, so you don't need to worry about those. Even if they went to the platform and they found it, it's anonymous, so you're good. Okay, so many times for that reason, Reddit is a good platform to play with uh, when you're doing risky, uh, delicate topics. Uh, the other practical approach in common sense measure, just use aggregate data whenever possible. So talk about 5% of people talk about the anxiety that it gives them to like whatever, consider this. So you have percentages and counts rather than specific examples. It's actually, scientifically speaking, a better approach actually because um, I call them the, the social media equivalent of N of 1 are these 
we found 200 tweets and they all say that the HPV vaccine kills people. Like, we can find pretty much anything in social media, okay? If I say it's, it's going to cause the apocalypse, you probably can find that. Uh, it is just that. It's, it's, it's an opinion. It's, a, it's an N of one, okay? Even if it's 200 of them. Without context, it means nothing, okay? So it's better to just get everything about the HPV vaccine or whatever it is that you're researching on and then do a systematic analysis of the tweets to try to see what percentage of people believe whatever it is that you're believe, that you're after, okay? So it takes a long time. Again, I go back to the how much time it takes to annotate a timeline. And, and, and you'll see that these things are not easy to do. Social media research is not easy to do. So some of, some of these are like common sense measures. I, I call them common sense measures. Um, which brings me to reproducibility. Data collected ethically from social media for research must be made available if at all possible. You cannot hide behind this like excuse saying, oh, it's social media, we're protecting our subjects and this and that. That's why we're not making available our data. That's not acceptable. It's not acceptable science. Because there's rules, that's why there are rules for these things. Um, Twitter, for example, allows you to make available all the Twitter uh, handles openly. So we could make those available. There's a limit on the number. So there's only 50,000 a day per user. So if I have a collection of 200,000 tweets, I can only give you 50,000 at a time, 50,000 per day. So there's like silly rules like that. I call it like, well, fine. Uh, but you abide by them. You abide by the by the platform terms of use. You abide by those rules, but you make them available. Um, what happens with this rule is many of the tweets are deleted. Therefore, when I hand you my data, if I use 50,000 at the time, and uh, by the time I give you the Twitter IDs, 20% of those will be gone. So that's a problem from the reproducibility perspective. What we do in that case, we keep a copy of the actual text of the tweets and that requires a little bit more layering so I don't just hand it out to everybody you have to write to us say hey do you have the full data set and we always do in the recent research don't ask me about things about eight years ago okay so we, I already talked about that uh, so recent research and I, I give like a ballpark of three four years after that things happen okay uh, hopefully, my hope is I can get it extended to 10 years, that you can get a paper of mine 10 years ago and still have the whole thing done so you can reproduce the research. The reason is not necessary to go that long, though, is because there's always papers that follow up, right? And so one paper builds on the prior one. If that was reproduced and it was done properly, then the next um, uh, results stand. And all you need to do is to compare to that newer paper in order to move forward. So you only need to keep this going for about three years. So that's kind of like my ballpark. Uh, when you publish, share your code and data and maintain it for at least three years. That way you can ensure that it's properly used and reproduced. Um, good science is reproducible. Okay. So you have to do good science in order to maintain the reputability, in a way, of social media as a valid, uh, as a valid data set. A lot of the bad rep that it has gotten is because of bad research. Okay, um, It's not really the fault of the media. It's just the fault of the researcher. And I include in that the Facebook Cambridge Analytica um, scandal of a, couple, of a year ago or two years ago. Um, I don't really don't blame Facebook. My idea of it, the blame is on the faculty member at Cambridge that started this all and didn't think through. Um, he saw the cookies on the counter and he decided to eat them. Okay, and it's not always okay to do that. Um, he got a consent to get one user, and those users had friends, and the data of the friends was available to the to the. Uh, uh, to the wall of the user, the original user, and he decided to go ahead and use that data as well, for which he did not have consent or that access to the friend's account. That was the core of the problem. That the Facebook software allowed it was why Facebook got blamed. 
but there's always going to be allowances. There's always, I mean, we're, uh, how many of you are developers? Like, the have written code. When you have written code, you realize, that's what I mean. <laughs> when you realize there's many ways around things. There's just so many ways. There's always going to be a way. Data cannot be locked up in like five different locks. It's very hard to get, get, get that level of assurance. So um, just do the right thing and don't use it. That's the thing where, where, where we go with the ethical thing. Reproducibility requires... Um, research integrity, open data, open code, version control. I'm borrowing this slide from someone, so you don't think that it's all my idea. I think this is not my my slide. Um, data secrecy is very, very close to scientific misconduct, and it goes to the point where it's actually like anything that's published that you cannot reproduce. To me, that paper should be ignored and not even cited. Okay, because it's just not. I mean, whatever it is, it's like how will you know that it's true? if nobody can reproduce what the findings were. Um, so there's, there's a spectrum. And we try to keep all research in, um, on the green there. Um, OK, some of the references that I cited. Uh, these three are the strongest. I uh, wrote a, a blog uh, by invitation of the NLM's director, Patty Brennan, um, on this particular topic. It, came out about seven months ago. You can still find it, Musings of the Mezzanine. It was an invited uh, blog. And I have all these citations there and others, if you're really curious about it. Um, there's a lot that has been done, a lot that has been learned. And I really, really encourage you to, like, whenever you're considering social media research, um, to abide by some of these guidelines. And, and it should be fine. It should be fun. And it should be meaningful. OK, and that concludes. I have. A little bit of time for questions, so uh, thank you so much.